All right. With that, we would like to. Uh, I would like to call to order the uh, July 18th, 2018 edition of the uh, Santa Barbara Airport Commission. And with that, we'll begin with the roll call. Karen Kahn. Present. Kirk Martin. Here. Craig Arcuri. Carl Hopkins. Here. Bruce Miller. Here. G Jim Wilson. Here. Paul Bowen. Here. Okay, and with that, before we get to changes to the agenda, I would like to take a moment and welcome our newest commissioner, Mr. Paul Bowen. It is indeed a pleasure, and we're so delighted to have him sitting on this side of the table. No offense to the audience, but it's, <laughs> a, <laughs> it's a pleasure. He's been on the other side for long enough, so welcome, and we're delighted to have you. Thank you. And with that, do we have any changes to the agenda? No changes, Madam okay. Chair. And the notice is that on Thursday, July 12th at 5 p.m., <coughs> the Airport Commission Secretary Dooley posted the agenda on the bulletin board at Airport Administration, which brings us to item two for public comment. Any member of the public may address the Airport Commission on any subject within the jurisdiction of the Commission that is not scheduled before them that same day. The total amount of time for public comment will be 15 minutes and no individual may speak for more than two minutes. Do we have any speaker slips? Uh, no, Madam Chair. No speaker slips, okay. Liaison reports. I understand that Michael T. Bennett has recent knee surgery and is not here, and also that Jason Dominguez called and said he was hung up at a meeting in Montecito, so we will hope he is able to join us a bit later, and if so, we'll return to his report. Very good. And with that, we come to the City Administrator Report, Mr. Paul Casey and Assistant City Administrator <laughs> <retiring>. Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> as an intro, uh, <laughs> I did notify Airport Commission, as you know, that I am retiring effective uh, August 31st. And um, there'll be more to say about that <laughs> later. <laughs> but in the um, process of coming up with who's going to take my place, there is a procedure to be done, and it's in the uh, city charter as well as the municipal, municipal code. And so Mr. Casey is here tonight to give you some information about um, how he's going to go about replacing me. I can't replace me. We think you're me, irreplaceable, so, exactly. so I don't <laughs> know that this is a, a, an actual possibility, but we'll let, you, we'll let you try to convince us. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. So first off, good evening. Uh, it's nice to be here. I'm Paul Casey. I'm the city administrator. Hazel uh, is being much too modest. Uh, I, I want to congratulate her on just an outstanding career. And yes, there will be future opportunities to talk more about her accomplishments and wish her well. But I publicly in front of the commission want to congratulate her as city administrator for being such an outstanding A, city employee, B, airport employee, and then C, airport director, because uh, I look at her as all three of those things. She has a career that spans 31 years. She's touched just about everything out here at the airport and put her stamp on it. She has an awful lot to be proud of. Uh, she's also, as I have mentioned as I go around the Thank You Hazel tour, um, yeah. one, of the, one of the nicest people you will ever meet, and I'm sure you have seen that in all of your interactions with her. And as the city administrator, one of the things I have complimented her on uh, is the position she has left the department in, which is in a very strong position. She has built a new and very good management team uh, right beneath her, which I think gives us the confidence that the airport is in good hands uh, moving forward. But that doesn't happen by accident. That happened because of her leadership and her selection process and, and training and bringing in uh, the three folks here who weren't here. Uh, well, Jeff's been here, but <laughs> her, her new team that, you know, she's established a new team at the management level just over the last few years and has done a very good job. So I just want to congratulate her on that. Um, Hazel is not replaceable, that is correct, but we do need to move forward. So I just wanted to talk to you and give you the opportunity to let you know uh, my thoughts about how to go about this process, how I want to be engaging you all through that process and answer any questions that you might have. Uh, 
so department heads report to me. We are in the council manager form of government. Uh, city council makes two appointments. They appoint a city attorney and they appoint a city administrator. And then the charter and municipal code charge me with uh, running the day-to-day -day operations of the city, which includes the airport uh, department for the city. The charter also says, though, that the airport commission plays a role in that process as well which is why I'm here and I will be back with you all uh, to get more input from you on a number of things. Uh, before I get there, let me step back and say I do need to uh, do some work on my end to position the department for when he, Hazel retires on August 31st, and that is appoint an acting airport director. So I will be interviewing uh, and talking to airport department staff. I'll be interviewing individually and with Ms. Antill, my assistant city administrator. I forgot to introduce Pam. She's in the front row and will be helping me here. Uh, I'll interview uh, individually the management team as well as talk to department staff, talk to other department heads and such, and choose someone from within the department most likely to serve as acting airport director and then move on a more formal process for selecting the next airport director on a permanent basis. As with all department head vacancies, and uh, you know, they happen, they do occur, I fully expect to do a full recruitment for the position. It's part of my executive management team and I just think it serves the city's interest the best to open up the recruitment for a department head position and hire the best candidate that we have. Sometimes that's an internal candidate, sometimes it's not an internal candidate. So there's no bias one way or the other, and, and I've hired both internally and externally for a department head position. So I will do that. I will have an acting director in place uh, before Hazel leaves on August 31st, so there's a seamless transition, and the department will have leadership and move forward on that. Going forward, we will then do a full recruitment for the airport director, and that's where I would like to engage you all in that process. And I'd like to engage you in a couple ways. I will most likely hire a recruiting firm to help me with this recruitment. Airport, airports are unique creatures. Uh, they're a specific field within the industry. They're sometimes under city government, sometimes they're not. Uh, it's not a typical recruitment that a city will do for an airport director. We have success and have used uh, an airport recruitment firm uh, for other key management positions that we've been very pleased with their work and so we're considering uh, going and, and consulting with them. If we hire them, I expect that I'll ask them to come back and meet with you all and get your input about the qualities of what we are looking for uh, in the next airport director. You can say clone Hazel, but we'll prod you for more information beyond that about what those qualities are. Uh, I will say, Hazel's been fabulous. Karen Ramsdale was fabulous. This is an opportunity for new leadership, and that's okay. Uh, and that's what happens in organizations, and, and it's good. Uh, it's good to have change and just a different perspective and a new approach. And so I'm not looking for someone to duplicate Hazel completely, but she has a lot of qualities that I think we would agree we would want to look for in, in the next director. But so be thinking about that. So we'll come and ask you what are the qualities you're looking for. We'll also ask you of what are the issues that the next director is going to be facing. So be thinking three years, five years, seven years out about what this tenure of this next person uh, will be faced with challenge-wise. And that will help me in uh, evaluating the candidates and it will also help the recruiter in selecting the candidates. What the recruiter will do after they gather that information, they'll put together a brochure. Uh, and announce the opening for the position, they will hopefully have a Rolodex of good aviation officials from throughout the country that they're going to call and say this plum opportunity of a position has occurred that hasn't opened up in how many years? Uh, we couldn't, you know, when, when did Karen Ramsdale start? You know, it's been 83, so it's been 35 years since, uh, you know, we've really had kind of a good fresh look at this position. And so I hope that there will be good candidates who will look at it seriously. It's a fun airport. You all know that uh, being on the commission, uh, having commercial aviation and general aviation is really interesting. Having all of the light industrial and, and lease space that we have, having the fixed based operators and others, there's just a lot of fun, interesting parts to this airport. Uh, and plus it's in Santa Barbara, which is really good as well. So we'll do a recruitment. The uh, consultant will go out and beat the bushes and try to drum up candidates. Uh, they will hopefully get a long list of candidates. They will then match that based upon the information they've received about the qualities we're looking for and, and the skill set. 
and we'll hopefully narrow it down, uh, running it by Ms. Antill and myself, to a group of, it's hard to say, could be six, could be eight candidates to do a more thorough interview process with. The consultant will do interviews with kind of their top uh, folks as they kind of narrow it down. And that's when we'll come back to you again and ask most likely for two of you to sit in on that interview panel process because I'd like to get your input and uh, help in that. I'll put together a couple panels. Hopefully they include a couple of you. We'll ask you as a commission to formally appoint two of yourselves to be on that interview process. Uh, I'll have a couple department heads most likely. I'll ask other airport officials from other neighboring jurisdictions to assist from a professional peer standpoint review. And then maybe a couple uh, community people who have interest uh, in and around the airport. So I haven't finalized my thought process of who will be on that panel, but that's kind of the general direction I'm leading towards. Hopefully at the end of the day, the, the, the panels will come together and have evaluated the candidates and there'll be kind of a breaking point, maybe two or three that kind of stand above the rest. And then I will go and do in-depth one-on-one interviews uh, and look at the candidates through uh, a much more thorough lens. I'll be looking for who's the best person to lead the department, who's the best person to work with you as a commission, uh, who's the best person that fits into my executive management team and can work with the other department directors? Uh, who's the best person that can represent the city of Santa Barbara out into the community uh, for a pretty high profile position? And so kind of factoring all that in. I'll then come back to you a last time, hopefully, and it's one of those rare chances where we'll get to meet in closed session because uh, we'll be talking personnel issues. And I will give you kind of all of that summation of process and I'll have a recommendation at that point and I'll be asking for you to concur with my recommendation as I take that to city council. If the process works well, we've narrowed it down and there's kind of some consensus forming and we'll have a good candidate to move forward with. And then I'll go to council and they do the final blessing and then we have a new airport director. So that's the process I hope to follow. It has worked well. Uh, similar process for the police chief that worked out very well. Similar process I'm following with the fire chief selection process, which is currently underway in a couple months ahead. It takes four to six months. It's just kind of how long that takes to do it right and do it thorough. It's a selection process I hope I don't have to do very often, so I'm happy to take the time. And again, I think Ms. Johns has left the department in really good standing. Uh, that uh, the day's business will be able to be carried out effectively and efficiently by the staff that we have. So that's, I just wanted to kind of let you know the process. Happy to answer any questions now and certainly we'll be back. Any questions? No, I think you did an excellent job of explaining how the process goes. Good, thank, thank you. you very much. So I'll be back with the consultant and then be thinking about if you have an interest to spend a full day on an interview panel. It is a full day commitment. Uh, don't take it lightly. Uh, it's hard and you're really tired at the end of it, uh, but it's an exciting opportunity uh, to be involved as well. Great. Thank Good. you so much. All right, thank you. Thank you. And that brings us to the did you have anything you wanted to say? Uh, I really didn't. I was just going to say your airport director could actually be in this room. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us to the consent calendar. Do I hear a motion regarding the consent calendar? I move that we approve the consent calendar, including uh, the minutes uh, waiving the reading property management report and the lease agreement with Omdahl Transportation Services. I second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, waive the reading of the minutes and uh, approve the consent calendar. Are there all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the consent calendar is so dealt with. And moving on to administrative reports. Item 8, we have the revised airport rates and charges <coughs> per turn fee. Uh, <coughs> yes, uh, um, Chair Khan, uh, Deanna is actually uh, going to be doing um, a number of these <laughs> on this page. So I'm just going to have her get started. Uh, and the first one is, as you said, the per turn fees, which will be amending our um, official airline rates and charges that we've done before. 
All righty, good evening, Madam Chair, Commission. I see that my slide is a little bit cut off at the bottom there, so hopefully that won't be uh, an impediment as we move forward. But it, as Hazel mentioned, I have um, actually five items for you tonight, all in a row, so uh, try to keep it interesting. Uh, the first one, of course, is about our um, revised airport rates and charges. As you know, every year we come to you for approval of our revised uh, airport rates and charges. Um, every year we uh, sit down and we could calculate mostly on a cost recovery basis um, what it's going to take to cover our costs on the commercial side. We sit down with the air carriers, we negotiate a little bit and come up with um, new rates and charges every year and of course then come to you for approval. So the last time we did this was in March and those rates and charges went into effect um, July 1st. So since it was March, we last looked at these. I thought I'd give you a quick little re overview reminder of what our current schedule of rates and charges looks like. Um, we have exclusive space rental. So that's, of course, ticket counter space, queuing space, office space for airlines. So it's space that once they lease it, no one else can use it. Um, and then we have a category of um, uses we call them joint joint use uh, joint space use, and that's the kind of things uh, like inbound baggage handling when people drop off their bags. Um, it's gate use and hold room use. It's inbound baggage when they come back, and it's um, baggage claim uh, use for passengers. So that's kind of grouped into um, space that all the carriers use. They they all use it at one point in time for their passengers. We calculate that, and I'm not sure we've talked too much about this in the past, um, by using what we call an 80-20 formula. It's a pretty standard formula for the industry where uh, we look at the costs for those facilities, and 20% of those costs are divided equally amongst the number of carriers that we have, and 80% of that is divided amongst the carriers by market share. Now, this class of uh, uses, or this class of, of fees, works really well when we have um, steady carriers that are offering year-round service, daily service, and they all have, if not similar market share, at least they all have a pretty robust market share. And so, so far, this, this formula has worked pretty well for us. Then we have a series of fees that are really per use fees. So jet bridge uh, fee, you pull up to a jet bridge, you're gonna pay us $45. If you park a plane on the ramp overnight, you're gonna pay us $45. Um, landing fees, of course, depend on the size of the aircraft. Um, currently it's about $4.07 per thousand pounds of landed weight. And then we also collect f uh, fuel flowage fees, and that's indirectly about five cents a gallon that comes through our FBOs when they decide to fuel. So that's kind of what it looks like today. So our prevailing assumptions, again, when we put together that schedule of fees is that we all have, that they're all signatory carriers. And I like to think of the signatory carriers as they're, they're our steady dance partners. They're with us all the time. Um, they give us uh, service year round and they're providing us daily or near daily service. Some of them are providing multiple flights a day. So then we welcome Sun Country Airlines, and this is really why we're here today, is because some of these assumptions are changing with the entrance of some of these new carriers, um, that we have two new carriers coming in. And so with Sun Country, of course, they fit none of those criteria. They, they are um, seasonal, so they are not going to be a steady dance partner necessarily. Um, they will lease exclusive space, um, so they will pay us uh, a rate for that um as at uh, the non-signatory rates so they will pay a, b a premium for that space um, and then we were tasked with trying to figure out how to charge them for the joint use of some of those facilities given that they use them on an infrequent basis and their market share compared to the rest will be very small so the key to that is developing a fair charge for the use of those that space in comparison to the other carriers so we came up with, well, actually, it's not that novel because, again, this is sort of an industry standard type fee, but we, we uh, devised a per turn fee, facility charge. And so that per turn fee is really capturing the outbound baggage, the gate hold, um, the inbound baggage handling, and the baggage claim use, all those joint things. Um, we calculate that. It's a formula and a spreadsheet that I could hold up for you, but it, it's, um, it's basically based on a per passenger charge. Um, it's some assumptions based on aircraft type, anticipated load factors, the number of monthly turns, 
And based on that, we calculate an inbound passenger cost and an outbound passenger cost. Those two things together become a per turn fee. Um, and how we actually bill that to the carriers, of course, they do report to us um, how many passengers they bring in, both inbound and outbound. And so we bill them on actuals um, in arrears after they've reported that. So next slide. So uh, based on the formula we calculated, this is an, uh, the, the per turn estimate here is actually an estimate. Um, the the D-plane passenger fee would be $2.19 per D-plane passenger. Um, a bit more for in-plane passengers, $3.57. Now if their plane comes in, and this is specific to Sun Country, if it came in completely full at 100%, it, it would be about $616.90. Most likely it won't be completely full every time, so it'll, it, it will vary um, depending upon that. And then of course this will not include exclusive space use or they're going to use a jet bridge, so they will pay extra for that. So with that, um, this item really is asking for your approval to add this um, fee to the rates and schedule charges that we have and then of course moving forward into the future you know, this is sort of a new reality for us and we have to, to, to factor in that this is probably an ongoing type of a fee that we'll, that we'll end up using. So with that, any, any questions? Uh, yes, I have a question. If, if you were to calculate this per turn fee for one of our signatory air carriers, how close would it be to what you're proposing? It, it's very close and actually that was really important for us to do because of course the first thing, if you're an existing carrier, you're gonna look and see, okay, are these guys getting a deal? So um, we made sure that um, th these folks are not paying, they're not paying less than what our existing signatory carriers are paying. And then of course for um, most of those per use fees, so the, well per use fees and the exclusive use fees, they're paying a 25% premium. So instead of, it happens to be for a signatory, $107 a square foot for uh, exclusive space, they'll pay $134 a square foot. And that's, that's pervasive throughout the schedule. So a signatory jet use is 45. I think it's $56.50 for a non-signatory. So they, they do end up paying a premium for some of those other things too. It, it sounds like a very fair pricing structure. Yeah, it is fair. Um, and, and in addition, of course, since they are a seasonal carrier and a non-signatory carrier, they, they won't be part of that annual sort of negotiation every year as to how the rates and charges are set up. That's the other benefit you get of being a signatory carrier. Thank you. All right. I'd like to comment that the lease review subcommittee did meet and discuss this and um, recommended it. Uh, I thought it was uh, very well thought out. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'd make a motion that we approve the per turn fee proposal. Second. Second. <coughs> it's been moved. I guess at that point I can ask if there's any discussion on the motion. <laughs> I'll do it. You second it down there? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. And if there's no d further discussion on the motion, um, we will now vote on whether or not to recommend approval of the per turn fee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the per turn fee passes. And moving on to the Air Service Incentive Program. In <coughs> the Air Service Incentive Program, the, uh, the initial one that we uh, established was in 2009, and it hasn't been um, updated since then, nor did it address low, low cost carriers. So um, it's uh, sort of goes hand in hand with the per turn fees that we also adjust the incentive program and uh, Deanna will present the changes that we're recommending on this one. Alrighty, um, so the Air Service Incentive Program, again, um, we're proposing some amendments for your approval here today, really to bring us, um, to, to play, catch us up with where we really need to be, um, uh, with where the industry is today and where, where it's heading. Even if Hazel said this program has been around quite a long time, um, it, it's, it's time for us to make a few refinements to it, and they really are pretty specific. So as Hazel said, it was established in 2009 um, by City Council resolution. Um, these programs are allowed by the Federal Aviation Administration, as you probably know. Um, with the stipulation, of course, that all carriers are treated equally. So any incentive offered to one must be offered to all. 
Um, the purpose, of course, is to incentivize new carriers um, to try new routes. Um, and it's really an industry standard concept. I can't think of an airport um, that doesn't have an incentive program of some, si of some type. In fact, it's become so established um, that the carriers expect it. It's not that they come and ask you, do you have an incentive program? They start with, what is in your incentive program? So we have one. Um, so as far as the current program, there's really two components to it. What, one is what qualifies for an incentive, and then what are the incentives? So what qualifies currently in the program, and this again is pretty industry standard, is that it, a new airline entrant that comes into a market with a new nonstop destination, a new nonstop service to some place where there is currently no nonstop service, or an incumbent airline with new nonstop service to an unserved destination. So a good example of the second one would be um, American Airlines when it started service to Dallas. So that was an incumbent carrier, but a new destination. It was kind of not really a new destination, though, because they had served Dallas many, many years prior to that. But the key was is that that wasn't served by that carrier for at least the previous 12 months. Um, and again, you'll find that in most, uh, in most incentive programs. Now, the, the program was intended for the kind of service that we typically have, which is daily service or at least five-day-a-week service. And um, in the materials uh, that accompanied the resolution, that was pretty clear. When we went and sort of really read line by line through the resolution as it stands today, it's a little unclear. And so now that we're faced with these carriers that are coming in with less than daily service, it becomes pretty important to be really, really clear about that. So the second component then is what incentives um, do we have? Um, mostly incentives have to do with, and regardless of where you go, um, reductions in fees or waivers of fees, um, and then marketing support, really those two types of things. In our case, it's waiver of landing fees, and um, it stipulates not to exceed 12 months from the start of service. Um, again, the assumption being that you're offering daily service um, and so we're waiving landing fees for a certain period of time. Um, marketing incentives, now um, those can be both non-economic, in other words, staff time, or if we're able to get publicity in the media, that kind of thing, or actually um, using our marketing budget towards specific um, promotions for um, a, a carrier or a route. So fast forward, it's really nearly 10 years later, um, some of the improvements or refinements, I should say, that we uh, would like to propose are, one, highlighting some of the non-economic incentives. Um, typically, we put in quite a bit of staff time um, promoting the new carriers. We also engage our consultants, our advertising agency, and that kind of thing. So those, um, we'd like to be able to quantify those a little bit better. Um, we'd also, and this is really, really key, have the ability to prorate the landing fees. So if you're providing service three days a week, well then the landing fee waiver would be in proportion to that. Um, if it's a new carrier, perhaps we, but not a new destination, perhaps there is some incentive. Um, however, if it's a new carrier and a brand new destination, f seven days a week, bingo, boy, that's really the best scenario, of course. Um, it does, as we propose it here, provide us with some of uh, discretion for the airport director with the commission's oversight basically because um, you know, it's hard to foresee what kind of situations we might be faced with, what kind of combinations. We're trying to foresee um, the types of service we might be offered, but it's hard to en envision everything we recognize. Um, and it looks like I'm gonna get chopped off a little bit at the bottom here, but uh, further refinements, we'd like to make a minimum requirement of two days a week service. Um, if a carrier starts out offering a certain level of service with landing fee waivers, if they then reduce that service, we'd like to be able to reduce the incentive as well. Um, we'd like to also be able to prorate the marketing support. Um, we've also found that in um, 10 years time, um, that $50,000 doesn't really excite the carriers anymore. <laughs> um, there's been inflation. So um, we, and, and particularly with some of the carriers that we've been, been courting pretty aggressively in the last couple of years, um, we recognized actually a while ago that we were gonna need to raise that cap. And again, that can be non-economic or economic incentives when it comes to marketing. 
and of course providing a little bit more support than just six months from the announcement into service because it, it just takes more time than that to, um, to penetrate the marketplace with a message. And then marketing plans, we would like to be able to, carriers you know, love to put together marketing plans, but we would like to be able to make sure that we have the ability to approve those plans as well if it is, if it's the airport's money that's going towards it. So with that, um, are there any questions about um, this? You have the resolution in your packet. Um, much of it is the same, but some of it is just trying to accommodate some of the changed realities that we're faced with. I have a question. Can you a little more extensively describe earned marketing value satisfies incentive? Ah, uh, yes. Well, um, w w we've learned that you know, we actually are fairly well skilled at, um, uh, at getting our local media to cover um, new service. And um, there is actually a way to quantify um, if you get a 30 second story on KEYT, you can actually quantify what that is worth if you were to buy that in the form of advertising. So we think it's fair if we're putting in the effort to try to publicize these carriers and routes that that kind of um, earned marketing as to in, as versus paid marketing um, is captured as an incentive. Any other questions? Uh, the lease review committee reviewed, I think it was the lease review committee, reviewed uh, this also. There were two items one of which I saw mentioned there, but not in the resolution. Um, there was a little concern among in the committee about the at the airport director's discretion. It's not because we don't trust our airport director at all, but to keep any uh, anyone else from looking at it and going, oh, you know, there must have been some kind of a deal. There were two things that I think were suggested. One was that there be documentation as to why we made this particular decision. And I thought we were also, it, it, there it said with commission oversight, I believe, and I'm not sure what that means. Is that a report or is that an approval? In other words, I believe from the lease review that we, uh, that the airport director would make a recommendation, the commission uh, would, with her, his or her reasons, and then the commission would approve whatever, probably whatever he or she recommended, but possibly not. And I don't see that th those latter two things in the re actual resolution. Well, for this piece, I, I can maybe let the cat out of the bag a little bit on Frontier and Sun Country that at this point, um, they don't appear to qualify for incentives. Had they qualified for incentives, for example, and I'll talk about Frontier, they're a new carrier, but they're flying to an existing destination. So, but it, had it been the case that we were, uh, we understood that we would be offering them in some incentives, we would be able to come to the commission and spell out for you, this is exactly what we think, you know, it, it's a five day a week service to a new destination, new carrier, waiving landing fees completely, or something less than that, a 20% waiver, or so that, so you would, would know what it is that uh, we would be offering the, the, the carrier. Uh, I, that's what my understanding was. I just didn't see that in the resolution and wonder if something to that effect should be in the resolution. We could certainly do that. Absolutely. That's just, that's, just ab that's absolutely the intention. So, so, so the new airport director will know what we decided. <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. It's easy to do. Okay. Paul? Yes, uh, I was at that same meeting, and I think some of the concern is uh, well, yes, we want the airport director to be able to do a great job and continue to do a great job, is somehow airing this a little bit because it's public money so that it, it's not just done in a meeting of staff and airlines, but somehow that the public can see what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I think the consensus was definitely to allow the airport director to have control. That was my impression from the meeting. And, my, and mine also. I think it's, as I say, it's um, just to make it public so that nobody can complain about it. Or if they do, they won't have anything to leg to stand on. Yeah, it was, it, it was transparency and, and have, continuing to build kind of a groundwork of how those sorts of uh, incentive decisions were made. Mm -hmm. Just to kind of keep track of it and what were the rationales. Might we with commission's approval add that particular t 
type of uh, comment into the refinement so that it might be with, with commission as opposed to oversight approval? Yes. If you'd like to propose an amendment to it, we can certainly do that. Any other comments? I would okay. suggest that we table the approval until that's been uh, amended. Is there any time mm. limit? Is, is this time sensitive? Uh, yes, uh, it is. Um, with other potential activities um, in the wind. So if we could just have you um, amend the resolution um, as you have proposed that any uh, incentives offered by the airport director would be um, reviewed and approved by airport commission. I would so move that. Okay. Yeah. And so we'll right. add that to the, the resolution and when we take it to city council we'll include that language in our staff report. Any discussion on the motion? Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we uh, re refine the recommendation to include with airport commission uh, approval. Right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay, the motion and carries. To be clear, are we then, we are approving this with the amendment? Yes, correct? yes. Yeah. Yes, with the amendment. Okay, and that brings us to item 10, the operating permit for Frontier Airlines. Yes. All righty. So now we are to our new carriers. This is exciting stuff for us to be doing operating permits for new carriers. Uh, Frontier, or F9 as we often refer to them. <laughs> so if you hear us say F9, that's what we're talking about. Um, they actually served Santa Barbara until early 2015, and they served Denver as their destination. So they are returning to us. In fact, um, they were nice enough to leave some of their old cabinetry and <laughs> things like that, so they're just going to pick right up and use it again. Um, but they're returning under new ownership. Um, they've got uh, new financing behind them, and they are building a fleet of new Airbus 319 and 320 aircraft. So. They are in expansion mode. They're dipping their toes in the water um, a number of other places, and we're happy that they're coming back to us as well. Um, they are a ultra-low-cost carrier. We thought we had low-cost carriers. Now we have ultra-low-cost carriers, um, and, and they certainly are one. Um, they're going to be flying three times a week to Denver, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. They will have a single class of service, so there's no first class on Frontier. Um, and these uh, aircraft that they will be flying, their, a, their 319 will hold 180 passengers. So that holds a lot of people. Uh, the thing we like about this is that Frontier is um, very positive to Santa Barbara. They know us from before and, of course, are talking about the possibility of um, additional destinations. So, in fact, when they're looking at their service to Santa Barbara three days a week, they're doing also calculations on five-day-a-week service and th those kind of things. So we like to see that. Um, they would operate as a signatory carrier, which is a significant for us. In other words, Steady Dance Partner. Um, they've told us um, they've told us outright that they think they're here for the, the long haul, which is good. Um, they are going to exclusively lease um, two ticket podiums, ticket counter podiums. Um, one of which still has their cabinetry in it, so it's great for them. Um, with so four positions, so four computers, baggage tag, printers, scales, that whole the whole setup. Um, they also will lease, obviously, queuing space in the ticketing lobby, and they will be sharing office space with Sun Country. So they are they're frugal indeed. Um, they um, will be uh, part of that joint use calculation. In other words, they're joining up with the, the other carriers to split the joint costs. Um, they will be operating out of um, gate five. So um, what's cut off on the bottom there actually is that um, they will be ground boarding. Not only ground boarding, but they will be dual door ground boarding. If you gotta get 180 people on a plane fast, I guess that's, that's how you do it. So the thing that's been great about this is that um, Alaska actually was using gate five. They have um, relinquished that gate podium, pulled all their equipment out of it. And um, Sun Country is getting ready to move in, pull all their equipment and everything to it um, starting Monday. So they're getting ready to go. Frontier. Frontier, excuse me. And that's the tough thing about two carriers at once. <laughs> Keeping them straight. 
All right, so just to give you a summary of what this means for the airport, um, it's great, obviously. Um, they're going to be leasing uh, square footage. So as I mentioned, ticket counter, uh, queuing space, office space, some storage space. Um, the Obviously, they're participating in the calculation of the joint use. And then all of them pay 25 bucks to use the PA system. That's a cost recovery item there. So their total monthly cost is estimated at $23,442. Now that could vary a little bit um, depending upon their load factors. If they go up, their, the joint use formula can change a little bit, but um, all for the good. Because um, we estimate actually fairly low um, load factors when they go in, you know, when they start up service and then when we see what their load factors actually are, we can adjust. So um, incentives, as I mentioned before, um, landing fee waiver, uh, well, they recognize that it's an existing destination. United flies to Denver. So um, they uh, are planning on paying landing fees, which is, this is great. Um, they understand how that works. Um, marketing support, we uh, started working with our marketing folks very early on with the first press release, the first media event, and we'll continue to do that. Um, we'll advertise, we'll, we'll use some of our existing uh, advertising allocation to promote the route, obviously, and then Visit Santa Barbara is always our partner to try to um, market the service coming into Santa Barbara from, from the destination. So uh, if you have any questions about that, we're hoping to ask for your approval for that operating permit. I have a question regarding will Frontier be providing um, service for Sun Country that their personnel will be working the Sun Country flights or does Sun Country bring in their own That's an excellent and question. pay their own fees? That's an excellent question. Actually um, both Frontier and Sun Country, uh, neither one of them will have employed staff here. They will both be utilizing a ground handling company, um, Aviation Port Services. It just so happens that they both separately did RFPs for ground handling and they selected the same ground handler. So given the lack of space that we have for offices in the terminal, we went to them and said, how would you feel about sharing an office? And they said, great. So that's what they're gonna do. And their schedules are such that they don't, they don't conflict so I think it's it's going to be a good arrangement for all of them. Okay. Once again, the lease review committee reviewed this and recommended approval. Uh, there are two questions I have. You note here that they will depart at 1122, getting into Denver at 248. When do they come back? What's their arrival time into Santa Barbara from They're Denver? Depart and arrive. Well, it's usually 50, 50, a 50 minute turn. Yeah, 9.15, somewhere around in there. It's usually they're on the ground 50 minutes, no more than that. So they'll get in here around? N no, is it? They arrive at um, 10.32 a.m. Okay. And they depart at 11.22 a.m. Okay, thank you. Uh-huh, that's Frontier. Right, and that 23000 and change, uh, that excludes <laughs> landing fees, so you have a ballpark on how much the uh, airport will collect in landing fees? Oh, wow. oh that's a good question. It's based on it's the based weight. on the landed weight. So off the top of my head, I don't know what that's going to be, but they'll pay the signatory rate for it, obviously. So we can certainly D does that fluctuate every time depending on how much fuel and how many passengers? No. It's just a fixed rate. Yes. It's based on the gross landed weight that's published for that aircraft. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank so, you. So provided they fly the same aircraft. So when we calculate landing fees for some of the carriers, obviously they had different aircraft, they turn out to be different. So. Thank you. So they will not be staying overnight. So they will come in, get their passengers and leave. Exactly. And Sun Country is going to be doing the same thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Do we have any uh, prior experience in working with uh, contract ground handling companies? Um, yes, we do. All, okay. all, all three of our existing uh, carriers use ground handling companies. They use different ones. And um, the one that uh, Frontier and Sun Country intend to use is the one that's currently being used by Alaska. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Will, the, will the ground handling company add additional employees for that or are they? Yes, they, they intend to hire a completely separate staff for that. Do we assume that the place people check in Frontier is also the place they will check in for Sun Country? 
that same physical ticket counters. counter space because mm -hmm. that's a after that is leased to Frontier. Do we have any additional space, mm -hmm. or that fills us up? We've got some additional space. We have some space. Um, they're actually going to be side by side. They'll have different computer equipment, um, but and it, it getting a little bit into detail. But Sun Country. Their setup is kind of a plug-and-play uh, setup, so they'll use the counter space. When they're not using it, they walk away from it. So there is some, there is some space that will be left from that. Sun Frontier is a little bit more traditional in that they will set up stationary computers and that kind of thing that will be there. So Sun Country is very much multiple use. Somebody else could come in and log in and get to their own system. And it's kind of like we see at international airports around the world where different carriers mm -hmm. uh, are handled throughout the day by one set of agents and it just happens what time of day it is as to what sign they put up yeah then we if we if we are successful in getting many more carriers we'll have to go to uh, a model that's more like that thank you other questions um, it's actually more related to the the uh, resolution that we just approved and and something you said triggered me to to understand it a little more. Yeah, I've read this, the resolution on the, the incentive program a few times, and you said that since Denver was served by another carrier, it didn't qualify. And, y you know, that, I, I guess, you know, every time I'd read the resolution before, I just sort of assumed that meant to by that same carrier, but it's really by any carrier. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it is, it's fairly subtle, I think, in the resolution. And so if there's an opportunity to maybe make that a little clearer in the resolution that it's not just that carrier but any carrier um, it would be just a recommendation if there's an opportunity for that but sure I don't have a Take question a look at that. any further questions on the frontier motion Carl motion and sure I'll, and uh, if there are no I other questions uh, you have a motion Carl go ahead I move that the we approve and authorize the airport director to execute the uh, operating permit with frontier Airlines. Okay. second any discussion regarding the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The motion for the operating permit for Frontier Airline carries, which brings us to item 11, the operating permit for MN Airlines LLC DBA Sun Country Airlines. Yes, Minnesota. They are bin based in Minnesota. That was a clue. So Sun Country, our, uh, our second carrier, um, making its entrance in August, August 16th. Um, Sun Country has uh, not served this airport before, so they will be new. Um, Sun Country is um, very much focused on tourism, and they fly from Minneapolis to warm and sunny destinations. Um, and they also have a fair amount of uh, charter travel. Um, they've been around a while, since 1983. Um, they've had some ups and downs as a carrier, um, particularly after 9-11 was tough for a lot of carriers, but they've um, been recently acquired by new ownership, so they've got new money behind them. Um, they are building a fleet of new Boeing 737-800s. Um, they have some 700s in their fleet, but they are phasing those out and um, going to be flying the 800s. They only actually have 25 aircraft in their fleet, so they're mm -hmm. still a pretty small carrier. Nonetheless, they are expanding uh, into multiple markets, Santa Barbara being one of them. Um, they are, too, a ultra-low-cost carrier. Um, their service will only be twice a week to Minneapolis, and as of today, it's seasonal service through December 9th. Um, they have indicated to us that there are, are other destinations that they would be interested in serving from Santa Barbara, but that is what we know today, is that they'll be here through December. Um, they're coming in on Thursdays and Sundays. They have different schedules for those days, which I can't recall off the top of my head. They, they're quite different. One's a morning and one's an evening. <laughs> um, believe it or not, they do have two classes of service, um, 126 passengers, not quite n near as many, actually, as, as on the Frontier um, aircraft. So they would be coming in as a non-signatory carrier. They're just so seasonal and their um, number of turns um, is just not significant enough to, to warrant them becoming in, coming in as a signatory carrier. Um, they still will exclusively lease some space. 
again they're going to uh, they're going to lease ticket podiums lobby space and then they're going to share the office space with frontier um, this is where we calculated the per turn fee in lieu of the joint use fees their market share will be so small and it just it just was very impractical to try to fit them into that mold um, they are going to use a jet bridge so we will charge them for a jet bridge fee at the non-signatory rate um, and they will actually use a mobile podium um, near gate 2 gate 2 is the gate that they would use it's a uh, mainline gate um, that uh, American also uses for the Dallas service but they will service that through a mobile podium that they'll put out and take away as needed so it's a it's a good uh, good solution for that that level of operation so this is what their cost uh, structure looks like um, they're going to lease um, 749 square feet again at a higher rate um, their per turn fees now this of course is again an estimate based on um, load factor you know it, it, it will change it won't exactly be that they do pay to use the, the PA system and um, we estimate that if they use a jet bridge every time they fly then that's what it would cost them per month to use a jet bridge so total monthly cost about a little shy of thirteen thousand dollars a month so um, but we won't have them for quite that long at least for that particular service so um, if you have any questions about this one so I have a question on the term they the term goes through December 9th now I would have thought people wanting to come from Minnesota <laughs> to warm, warm sunny places the high season of that would start about that time <laughs> yeah. was that decision based on this just being an experiment or is it based on it being they, they really think that this is the season and not December January that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't told why they chose this particular period of time. Um, it's also possible that they will continue after December 9th, perhaps with a different destination. Or maybe uh, their market is Santa Barbara's wanting to go to Minnesota. Uh, <laughs> in <no>. December. <laughs> well, so until, many do. Right? Until, yeah. uh, it's possible okay. that there would be uh, no population left in Minneapolis. By that <laughs> <time>. <laughs> or at least they're inside. Starting in December. <laughs> Once again, I'd comment that it was a long lease review subcommittee <laughs> meeting. <laughs> we also reviewed this and recommended uh, approval. I would like to ask um, on these last two that uh, after the meeting at some point, in the, you know, next tomorrow or whatever, that you might email out the estimate of the landing fees for mm -hmm. both of these. Mm -hmm. Are uh, there any incentives for this? Yes, and actually, I, I, I didn't turn to oh, this last go. slide. So the landing fee waiver, again, um, in this case, it's seasonal service. So by the current incentive program, doesn't qualify. A marketing sport, though, we are providing. Um, again, we, we connected early with their marketing folks, and um, we're offering staff mm -hmm. support. We'll allocate some of our advertising budget towards promoting that route. Um, and Visit Santa Barbara is actually going to do quite a significant promotion in Minneapolis because this is a, a great opportunity for them to, to fill that plane with people coming to Santa Barbara. So they're going to do a, a very nice promotion in Minneapolis. So um, it's, it's tricky from a marketing perspective because they're you know, not going to be flying it um, all that long, but we are um, wholeheartedly engaged with them nonetheless and want to see those planes filled. Is Visit Minneapolis going to be doing a marketing <laughs> here for the people there? Uh, we aren't aware. <laughs> I mean, obviously, we will pr be promoting the service to Minneapolis because for those who want to go there or connect other places as well. What, what would be the process, obviously, sometime in advance of December 9th, of them extending their service? Um, and would, would any of the terms or conditions change if they were to come for a longer term? I don't think that the, the, um, this type of carrier would continue their business model of seasonal service and less than daily service. Um, the destination that they might want to entertain could change so they could continue to go uh, from Santa Barbara to another destination. That um, usually the airlines do their forecast and load the computers for ticketing three months ahead of time. So I would say in the next, you know, shortly after they begin service here in August, 
come September, um, no later than October, I think we would see if there is going to be another destination. But the continuation of Minneapolis service, which of course we all think it would be logical to get out of Minneapolis in the winter and come to Santa Barbara would be a logical thing to extend. And if they wanted to do that, certainly they could. There, mm -hmm. So there's no process, there's no need for us to be. The reason we put in December 9 is that's what's in the system right now as to when the service expires. But should that service continue, obviously this would be amended or um, continue until um, otherwise. Have they specifically stated they only want to do service to December 9th, or that's only the, s that's the last date you can see the availability of a flight? It's the last availability of a flight, yes. Which, in essence, they said it was seasonal. They were only going to do it during the fall. So, um, in early December is still later than I would have thought. Okay. Any uh, other um, questions? Uh, yes. Uh, if they came back and at some point and said, yes, we want to extend it, or if, let's say next April, they said, yeah, we want to start up again, d um, does this have to come back to the commission and back to the city council, or it, are we essentially, if they want it, the same deal, can the airport director just say, same deal? Because we're, we're approving uh, executing an, an agreement here, and so the question is, if if they want to extend it beyond December 9th, do we have to go through this again? Or can we be renewable? It's renewable, as long as they stay within the parameters that are set for the. If they keep the exclusive space that they have, if they are still two days a week, if those things remain the same, then the calculations work. Um, if they come in and they say we want to do five days a week and we want to become a signatory carrier, that changes the the agreement. And then you would come back, have to uh, come then back. Then it would come back, right. Okay. okay. I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to d delay anything by having to go through, you know, extra. <laughs> <Once again. laughs> Any other questions? I'm worried about the PA system suffering uh, the <laughs> loss of the $25 out there on December 9th. I noticed Jeff was smirking at that as well. Okay. <laughs> I, I will say that the comments from the agents regarding the PA system mm -hmm. is one that ever since the new terminal has been built has been a cause of concern because all of them have pointed out that the PA mic is on the wrong side of the boarding door and that when the door opens up, the PA is over there and they want to stand over here to watch the people go by. So it's been a, a concern from day one. Any other comments? Do I hear a motion? I move that we approve. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded that we approve the operating per permit for Sun Country Airlines. And do we have no, no discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, the motion carries. And that brings us now to item 12, the lease agreement Northeast Hangar 4 Bravo. Right. Uh, commission will recall that um, last November um, City Council uh, entered into a, um, an agreement with Ampersand for a smooth transition of the property back to the airport on May 9th. Um, and as part of that transition plan, uh, Wendy McCaw um, requested that she uh, be able to remain in her hangar, hangar 4B, and uh, there was a price negotiated for that uh, facility. Subsequent to that and after the property reverted to the airport, um, Ms. McCaw elected not to enter into a lease agreement with the airport and subsequently removed all of her personal property from the facility. Thus, we didn't anticipate having Hangar 4B available for renegotiation, but we have, um, have need to lease it. And Deanna will give you a report on that procedure. And also we have one speaker slip um, on this item. So after the, the presentation, then uh, Mr. McBride is the, the speaker. 
Alrighty, and we're changing subjects completely, but this is one that you're obviously very familiar with, which is the hangar facility at 495 South Fairview. Um, I thought it might be uh, worth mentioning at this point that we also have another um, name that we have been using lately to refer to those hangars, and that is the Northeast Hangars. And that is because we figured out that, uh, of course, Signature has hangars one, two, three, and four. Their um, main facility is in hangar four. And there could be some confusion when we were referring to hangars one, two, three, and four in the large hangar facility. And I think uh, we heard the air traffic controllers were having some issues with that. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we have been referring to, to them as the Northeast hangars um, just to avoid any confusion about that. So um, this is, uh, you're familiar with the details of this, when it was built, how it's been expanded, how large it is, and of course, Ampersand's involvement with that and the city taking it back uh, in May of this year. Now at that time, so the prior hangar tenants, um, when it was under Ampersand, in hangar one, Signature had been there until 2016. Georgetown um, management, Craig McCaw, had been in hangar two um, and was until March of 18. Um, FedEx in hangar three. Uh, Esper Holdings in the uh, f westerly portion of hangar four, so 4A, uh, and Ampersand in 4B. Of course, all of this was before the power went out, but um, that's what it looked like on paper, at least. So um, our priorities, just to remind you of what we were focused on when we went to transition this hangar facility. Of course, we were looking for the highest and best use of the hangar space, maximum utilization of the space. I mean, it's really pretty simple. We wanted it to be really used to the, to the greatest degree possible. Um, we were looking for the opportunity to really have a good, effective oversight of what was going on in the hangars and on the ramp, um, which of course is where we, how we arrived at um, uh, our FBOs, our existing FBOs on the field, um, taking over the responsibility for managing those. We were able to achieve that. And then of course we wanted to maintain flexibility for the future redevelopment of the FBO um, business, so all of the leases have been, so far, short-term leases in this facility, um, coterminous with the leases that Atlantic and um, Signature um, have otherwise for their business. So post-transition, it's hard to believe. It's July. Um, we're not quite done yet, but it's a big difference from um, May. So Signature is in Hangar 1. Atlantic Aviation is in Hangar 2. FedEx is still in Hangar 3, and we are working with them to negotiate a longer-term lease. Um, and Hangar 4A, uh, last we talked about this, um, the commission approved an option for Signature um, to lease that space. And since then, Signature is taking that space, and they will be subletting to Esperora Holdings that was previously in that space. So, and we'll have room for other tenants in there as well. So, and as Hazel mentioned, Hangar 4B, uh, we thought, of course, was going to Ampersand Aviation, which, of course, from our standpoint, didn't really fulfill the first criteria for us, which was the maximum use of the facility. It would have been storage for one aircraft. But that's, that was a consequence of, of negotiating a settlement agreement for that smooth transition that we got. So that unforeseen opportunity um, by them vacating um, you know, we had been focused, obviously, on storage of aircraft, and um, we were obviously able to achieve some good efficiencies with that. Um, so now we could take a bigger picture look at it and ha look at the opportunity to see um, what greater benefit we could provide for the airport with that hangar that we didn't figure we were going to be um, able to lease uh, to begin with. And we settled on this alternative, and that is um, signature flight support um, leasing that hangar um, and then um, striking a sublease agreement with Coastal Aviation Maintenance, which is a current Signature Flight Support tenant. So they are a subtenant currently. They would continue to be a subtenant, but in a different facility. Um, the facility that they are in currently is about 9,600 square feet. The hangar space 4B is about 20,000 square feet. So it's a big difference in size, obviously. 
So the point here is that Coastal would operate as an FAA certificated repair station, 145 repair station, and it would really expand the capabilities um, for uh, maintenance on larger mainline aircraft than what they can get into the current hangar. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to test the market for uh, maintenance activities on the field. And of course, um, to the degree that there is space available, Signature would be able to store transient aircraft as well in that space. So um, definitely uh, fulfills the, uh, uh, our ambition to try to use that space as effectively as possible. So the terms are, are pretty similar to what you've seen before. Um, Signature would pay a dollar per, per square foot. Of course, um, they would sublet to Coastal, which would pay something more than that. But um, I can tell you there's not a, not a lot of meat left in the bone there. Um, so this is a good, a good rate for us to be getting for that hangar space. Um, by now, of course, um, some time has elapsed, so it's less than two years. Um, and the benefit, of course, of the airport is that um, Signature would continue to maintain the management and the oversight of all the subtenant activity um, there, which, of course, the airport isn't quite in the position to be able to do. Um, any questions about that? Yes, um, the fact Coastal is currently in Hangar 3, and that would become... Vacant, uh, I would believe. Uh, Matt Long would probably need to speak specifically to that, if you like. Aircraft storage. Yep. Matt, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commission. Uh, yeah, so basically Hangar 3 would become available storage space. Um, we have long been at 100% occupancy within our hangars. So um, I've already got a couple plans in place on what we can do with that space to backfill it. So it's, it's not a concern of mine at all. Okay, any other, any other questions, questions I can answer? Yeah, yeah, we do have a speaker, but I was gonna see if anybody had any questions here with oh. clarifying the actual process. I'll wait until after the speaker. Okay, and our speaker? Uh, Madam Commissioner, Commissioners, Bill, I'm Bill McBride. I'm the owner of Coastal. So I think I've spoke with many of you before at other meetings or at airport functions and spoken with the staff. Um, well, we're really excited about this opportunity. Um, you know, we've been here nine years. We've grown the business about as far as we can under our current space restrictions. We have two hangars now, Hangar 3 and a small hangar adjacent to that. But neither hangar is really capable in size of, of doing work on a number of the tenants that are based here as well as um, transit aircraft that come into town. So it's been a real problem for us and it's resulted in us having to not be able to do some work and MEL planes out of here and such. So we think this will really enable us to take the next step. We are currently a 145 repair station already for avionics. We have been, uh, we're going to be adding maintenance. The, the only limiting factor to us adding maintenance in the past has been the lack of an adequate space. So we've already met with the FAA several times and they're ready to add that designation as soon as we have the adequate space to do the work that we need to do. Um, so, you know, we think that it'll be good for us, obviously our business and growth, but also be good for the airport and being able to provide better maintenance services for a number of tenants that, like I say, now can't get in the hangar as well as transient aircraft. Also, we have you know, had to do work on airlines. We do all the work on the airlines, but we've had to you know, basically put them in a temporary hangar over there, bring equipment over there, and try to supervise that from across the field, which is not uh, very um, economical for us or for them. And so we'll be able to better serve them as well. So if there's any questions. Questions? Thank you. Okay. I think that was the last of our lease review <laughs> subcommittee <laughs> items, <laughs> uh, which we also recommended approval on. And I certainly think it's extremely important to have maintenance facilities, good maintenance facilities for any type aircraft that come in here. I happened to be over near Coastal today and saw what looked like an airliner out there having to be parked out because they can't get in near the, the existing hangar. It's wide enough for a light twin and, and that's about it. Um, and I know certainly as I fly around the country, um, when I'm looking at an airport, if there's no maintenance on the airport, I go someplace else. Mm -hmm. um, because you, know, you don't want to land in an airport and have a problem and then have to have somebody driving in for you know who knows how long. 
and I'm sure that that many aircraft would avoid any airport that does not have adequate maintenance. So I think this is a very positive thing, obviously for coastal, but just as importantly for the airport. Okay. Yeah, it really seems like it solves a pro several problems all at once. Which yes, it does. Ideal. And, uh, and might be more of an enticement for airlines too, once there is the availability of maintenance and, and larger maintenance, which mm -hmm. can, can frequently be the economic difference between a flight going with the passenger load it needs to, as opposed to having to mm -hmm. block seats, et cetera, okay? Yeah, it would seem like a very positive step forward for us. Mm -hmm. I think all of us will agree this has been a very, the staff has done a great job of finding a higher source or a higher value for the airport here. So mm -hmm. thank you for your good work. Thank you. I guess the only thing we, we now is to fill the office space. Is that habitable? <laughs> uh, will be. <laughs> we'll work on that as well. All right, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask you about the progress of the um, electrical work in your director's report. Mm -hmm. So if we have no further discussion on the lease agreement, do I hear a motion? I move to approve. Okay. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the Northeast Hangar B uh, agreement. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that lease agreement carries. And that brings us to item 13, the Runway 725 Overlay Project Update. Which was not discussed. In the <laughs> but <laughs> this is something new for uh, commission. Um, and we have a new speaker uh, who's going to do the presentation tonight. Aaron Keller, our um, operations uh, manager, will do the presentation. And I ask him to do this because so many times we focus on the, the engineering side of things when we do major rehab on the field, but there's also a, a major role that operations plays and maintenance plays when we have construction on the field. So I've asked Aaron to, to provide the, the presentation tonight on a project that's um, been well received and, and well done. Good evening, Commission. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight. And I'm um, excited to share with you that we've now wrapped up the completion of our 725 project. Um, $8 million investment in our community, our facility, and we're very excited to share that with, with you and the public. Um, as you know, um, this is kind of a, a takeaway from our project engineer, Leif Reynolds' presentation in late 2017. So some of this will be uh, a repeat for you. I will uh, go through it a little bit quicker on some of those pieces for you. Runway uh, 725 is 6,052 feet long by 150 feet in width, as our uh, pilot aviation community knows. Uh, seven is our primary instrument runway, grooved, and over a million square feet of asphalt concrete out there that, we're, uh, that we've dealt with. Um, as you may recall, um, for those who have not seen the runway um, as of late, this is the condition that it was in when we started construction. And I'll just kind of walk you through the process here. The schedule is outlined. As of April 8th, we began construction. That ran through May 25th. We did go a little bit longer on the tail end of that as we had some, um, I would say it was basically a, a slower production night uh, here and there. So it did take us into the next, uh, next week. However, on June 10th, as anticipated, we did close the runway down between the hours outlined, um, midnight and 0600. Uh, for the runway grooving. I am happy to share with you that we did complete the project as scheduled on July the 6th. We opened up 0600 that morning and uh, we definitely appreciate all of the uh, cooperation from our stakeholders as we completed the work. So after construction, a nice shiny new runway, um, the black top, Paint, retroreflectivity, exactly what we're looking for. Uh, the grooving, which was the, the latter half of the project, this is exactly uh, what we're doing to basically have the water drain off the runway and improve the coefficient of friction for our landing aircraft. Um, and any time you're uh, anytime you have air, airport construction on the airfield, we go through a rigorous process with the FAA for our approval and our construction safety phasing. Um, as such, we did have an FAA approved construction safety phasing plan. So not only does the, the construction safety phasing plan 
kind of guide our operational safety on the airfield. Um, we have many other safeguards in place, such as our uh, advisory circulars and, and FAR Part 139, which is our, our the regulation uh, governing the commercial service airports. Um, and the, within the construction safety phasing plan, um, there are many caveats, as you have seen if you've been out flying around during the, the project, um, regulating the barricade placement, uh, lighted X's, et cetera. Um, this is also uh, involves an extensive review of all the markings and lighting as we start to enter into the project to, main to ensure we can maintain our, our required tolerances uh, by the FAA for edge lighting, things of that nature. So there were some challenges to share. Um, as with most construction, there are unforeseen circumstances. Um, initially, our engineers estimated we were going to have about five inches of asphalt that would need to be removed due to the delamination that was occurring uh, within the actual asphalt concrete itself. They did find that it was actually at about 5.5 inches. Um, and if you can recall this from the original presentation, um, this is w the core samples that were taken that guided the initial budgeting process for us. Um, but these are only core samples. It doesn't reflect the reality of what's down there. So we found that it was a little bit deeper, about a, you know, I believe it was a, on the tune of a half million dollar change order. But that's good. It, that the, the benefit of that is now we have another half inch of good brand new runway out there. So there's benefit to that. We pay for what we get. Um, let's see here. One of the other challenges with this project, as we know, we're paving 300 feet of runway every single evening, uh, overnight I should say, and with that we had to maintain very specific transitional surfaces on the uh, runway, not only for the runway itself, but for each intersecting taxiway, um, to the tune of about $20,000 for each transition. So every night we close the, the field, we have to open it back up with the transition in place. Uh, it's a 15 to 1 ratio uh, that we have to have per FA specification in order to remain safe for aircraft operations. Um, as I had alluded to earlier, uh, the, the paving did go a bit longer. Five additional paving shifts were necessary, which means five additional transitions were required for the project. And just for the benefit of everyone, um, the transitions are laid out um, right here. So it's basically, you, we come in, we'll pave that down 15 to one, come back, grind it out that uh, next day and then start the paving process over again. So kind of a financial recap for you. As you will recall, we were looking uh, approximately 7.4 million in total for the project. By, by the time everything was wrapped up, it was closer to 8.4 million. Um, but one of the most outstanding pieces of this is uh, the FAA support. Um, they've really stepped up, and I think this speaks to the awards that we were speaking to in the previous meeting where uh, they recognize specifically our engineering, um, our engineering teams and, and, and management teams uh, interaction with the office where they stepped right up and they said, you know, don't, don't, don't sweat it, we'll, 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 we'll cover the, the difference there. So um, the airport did match that with our 9.34% uh, required match at $782,000. And of, of course, as with most construction projects, there are minor interruptions, but overall, um, airlines were very accommodating with the uh, proposed construction schedule, and our uh, staff had direct coordination with airlines and our tenants, um, and tried to get the word out as far as we could through our FBOs and other uh, stakeholders. So again, just thanking everyone. This is uh, certainly by, n by no means a, a, a one-person show. Uh, while uh, Leaf, our project engineer, was very much the lead on this project, um, this involved a lot of cooperation from FAA air, air traffic control and our uh, tech operations folks. Th they're the ones that maintain all of our ILS navigation equipment and FAA uh, equipment on the airfield. Finally, our contractors, Granite, and um, excellent oversight by Tartaglia Engineering. Um, kudos to them, did a great job for us. And then uh, obviously our city staff, engineers, maintenance and operations. Um, you know, we had maintenance staff from FAA Tech Ops and city maintenance staff on site every single night when we shut down and every single morning when we opened up. 
Uh, we also had our operations staff out performing uh, the required safety inspections before aircraft operations occurred the next morning. So uh, there was a lot of folks who were out here making this happen in the middle of the night, making the dance work. So uh, here we are, um, 2018 overlay and grooving has been completed. Um, however, we're looking out into the future and um, let's, let's start thinking about the next project, 2030, down the road. It'll be time to, time to pave again. So with that, I'll, I'll open it up for any questions you may have. Um, I have a question regarding the airlines. Will we not have, have we got the early departures um, or any late arrivals returning or that waits till the schedule change in September? I believe we negotiated with uh, the airlines and they restarted service, early morning service, uh, right after we completed the, the project. Great. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, it was just United that was impacted on their schedule and a couple of flights. And the late arrival was also just United? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I did mention this at the lease review subcommittee meeting, but congratulations to you and the whole staff for completing this on schedule because anybody who's been involved in construction realizes how difficult and rare that is. So good job. Thank you. I'll take that back to the team. Anyone else? Questions? I right. did notice there seems to be a common theme here. You were making the dance happen. <laughs> uh, Deanna had the steady dance partner, <laughs> and I believe the dance card was full. So there seems to be a lot of dancing going on here. You know, when you have the analogy, just run with it, right? <laughs> and I will tell you, as of Tuesday morning, the crossing of 1-5 right over 7 no longer seems to do a lot of the flying you into the air inadvertently, <laughs> so it's very nice. That's good to hear. <laughs> Talk about a ramp. <laughs> right. Thank you. Okay, with Thank that, you. we move on to the director's report. And I just have just a couple of items to, to brief you on. Once again, I just am so excited about our uh, passenger traffic increases. Uh, I, in my history, I do not recall a percentage increase as Alaska achieved 58 percent. I mean, that's just unheard of, but that's outstanding. And each one of the carriers showed growth. And so for June over last June, we're up 16.36 percent. That's just a, an amazing number. Um, in your packet, you had asked about the um, electrical at uh, the 495 South Fairview, uh, we are on, and I'll have Jeff talk just briefly about the, the um, temporary power as well as kind of fill in for leaf on the um, replacement, the permanent power project. Can I make just one comment to the passenger count? Sure. And that is wondering if Alaska bringing in their 737 may have contributed and to their increased passenger traffic just because people like bigger airplanes? I believe that's part of it, but they've also had a really strong marketing program, fly for $69 or $89. Um, I mean, they really wanted to fill those seats, and they were doing that. So I think both things helped. Yes. Great. Thank you. So generators in 495 uh, Fairview, uh, we got those in place um, June 10. We started those at uh, FedEx, and then as the tenants came into hangars, one and two and four, we've um, turned those on. So we have three that are running continuously. They're permitted by ABR. They're the top um, least uh, emission engines available on the market for air pollution. So um, we've, we've had pretty good luck so far. We have a backup unit at FedEx, so just in case the, the current unit should fail, we have a backup that can transfer automatically to provide power there. Um, <coughs> as far as switch gear, the, the Physical switchgear equipment is supposed to be here um, in August, late July or August, and at that point it'll start being installed. Um, they're also running feed, uh, electrical feeds to the different um, hangers. Several of those failed, so we elected to replace the feeds to the hangar switchgear, the individual hangar switchgear. So that's where we are on that project. Still looking at probably October before that's completed. but all on schedule. And you know, previously, if LEAF says it'll be done by this date, 
you can take it to the bank, so to speak. Not dancing that one around. <laughs> um, also, I wanted Erin to just give a, a short uh, advertisement or um, on the ASOS training that uh, the airport's going to uh, be sponsoring. And you might say what ASOS is. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the uh, industry recognized associations that many of us belong to is the American Association of Airport Executives. Um, as such, they are known throughout the industry for providing excellent training opportunities for folks within the airport industry. Specifically, um, one of the, actually was the very first course I attended um, back in 2005 was the, their basic airport safety and operations specialist school. It really paints a, a good picture for the overview of what's required to operate in, in an airport. Um, everything from the, the terminal complex to the airfield, management, uh, et cetera. Um, so as such, we've been working with AAA to contact, bring them on site, and we're going to be uh, hosting on October 15th and 16th our own uh, local tailored basic airport safety and operations specialist school. And it also has a, a ancillary benefit of helping us network with some of our peer airports in the region. We're going to be uh, extending the offer to uh, anyone and everyone uh, to the public if they should wish to um, pay for a registration through AAAE to attend this course. Um, we're going to be sending approximately 30 of our staff members, not just operations staff, which again this is tailored for, but for um, our other staff members and other divisions that might want to know a little bit more about what makes the operation run. So we're very excited to have this and um, in October we'll, we'll uh, invite AAAE on, on site. It's going to be um, actually taught by a uh, lead certification safety inspector from the FAA who's been in the Northwest region by the name of Mark Taylor and then he's gone on to do some SMS, uh, uh, I believe it was SMS, don't quote me on that, um, some consulting work. So he's a, a great resource and I look forward to, to sharing his education with our staff. Great, well we hope it'll be open to commission members if they have an interest. Great. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I'm sorry. Also, <laughs> thank you, Erin. Um, next month um, at our commission meeting, um, we're going to have two updates on two outstanding projects. One is the specific plan um, update that has been uh, under contract. Um, they will also be doing stakeholder consultation in August. So we want to have an update on that project. And then we'll also have an update from our consultant, uh, Lee Fisher, on the FBO relocation program that's underway as well. There'll be a few other things on the agenda, I'm sure, but those two I wanted to, to point out. Um, so come prepared with questions when we have it. With that, uh, unless you have other, oh, one other thing in the noise chart that you have at the back, um, I was interested in the increased numbers of complaints from Hope Ranch, and generally those are from uh, commercial airlines flying straight in because some of the pilots just don't understand the, the uh, noise abatement procedures. So I've asked Aaron um, to give you kind of a summary um, of what took place uh, that generated that many noise complaints from Hope Ranch. So over the, um, excuse me, the month of June, we had a, a total of 83 noise complaints. 49 of those originated from Hope Ranch. Um, so Hazel has asked um, our staff if we would do a little bit of research into exactly what had occurred during that instance. What we found was uh, there were seven aircraft that did not abide by our voluntary airport noise maintenance procedures. Um, of those seven, three of them were, were airline aircraft and the other four were GA. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sending out an educational letter for each of those uh, operators just to bring them up to speed with what our expectations are for our voluntary noise abatement procedures. Um, there were quite a few other instances of a, a noise complaint that was uh, correlated to a flight track, but all of the remaining other than the seven that occurred um, were actually uh, following air traffic control vector instructions for, for spacing into the facility. So um, while they were a, a non-standard operation, they were following air traffic control instructions. Thank you. Well, we will assume that weather was not a factor on any of these since they are a 2-5 arrival and not a 7 arrival. That's correct. 
with okay. that, that completes my report, unless you have other questions. Commissioner. A question probably yeah. for Mr. McKee on one of our favorite projects, the solar project. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> it, it stated that the uh, plans were resubmitted were deemed incomplete. Was the, the resubmitted plans incomplete or the prior plans incomplete and the resubmittal was to correct the incompleteness? <laughs> Basically, the contractor is going through the process both with ABR and with the DART um, Development Action Review Team. Um, it's kind of a process that they go through um, comments, improvements, mm -hmm. and then comments. So um, the contractor is working through the process and improving each time he submits. I, su I suspect one more submittal will be required, right. and he'll probably have. So approval. the set that was resubmitted was incomplete. So that people right. Can okay. So any estimate on when that project will? I don't have an estimate. I'm meeting with him tomorrow. Um, we have kind of a standing meeting, but we haven't been able to meet the last few weeks. So we'll, I'll get an update tomorrow. Cool. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you all.